we've done so far is we've done some very simple dynamics where we, we've kept track of stuff in warehouses, we've transported it. Um, what we just did here is we looked at a stochastic um, uh, signal, in this case demand. Um, now I want to simulate one other thing which most people never deal with in, in models, but you, you can deal with in models, and, and, and certainly in models in, in the arenas we, deal, we, we run in, we deal with them all the time. And that is sudden events. So um, accidents or, or, or uh, uh, I, I told you we work at mines a lot. Mines have accidents. You know, these haul trucks roll over or something happens. And they, they are very careful about these things. They take it very seriously because it costs them money and, um, and PR. And so they, they, they keep great statistics on these things. So you can actually model, you have statistics on how often there's an accident or something like that. So we can model, and things like that could change your system. And you shouldn't just ignore them. Uh, a, a, another example is if you're modeling uh, the movement of water around, let's say, a mine, the pumps fail. Pumps fail, right? We've all had pumps fail, or you know, a sump pump or something fails. There are statistics on how these things fail. Believe me, there are statistics, right? They, people keep track of this stuff. You can describe statistically how often a pump is going to fail. And when it fails, what does it do? It might have some serious consequences. If it happens to fail right in the middle of a rainstorm, Ooh, some bad things could happen. What's the probability of it failing while there's a rainstorm? Well, you can model those things. So we're going to actually model um, a, uh, an accident. So we're going to say that every, about every 30 days, a forklift runs into a carton of widgets in Warehouse 1. Okay? And he immediately destroys 1,500 widgets. That's what happens. All right? So let me, let me do this. You don't, you don't necessarily have to follow along. It's a little bit trickier than the other ones, but you can try if you want. So I want to, the couple things I want to do here is, first I, I, I say, I know how many widgets I'm going to destroy. I said 1,500. But I said the accident happens about every 30 days. I'm not saying exactly every 30 days. On average every 30 days. Those are the statistics that we've seen that about every 30 days we see that we have a forklift accident in the, in the warehouse. So we can model that and the way I would model it is in, in our software we have an object called a timed event. All right, So a timed event, I'm going to say this is, we'll call this accident, and we say how often does this thing occur? And how does it occur? So for example, some events are regular. So if I was simulating um, payday, hopefully that's regular, right? It's every two weeks or, or whatever, every week, right? It's a regular event, so I can specify an event happens over regular time intervals, you know, once every seven days. So that would happen exactly every seven days. Something would happen every seven days. But I want this to be a random event, and so it's going to happen at random time intervals, but there's some statistics behind it. It's once every 30 days. So I've said once every 30 days randomly, this accident occurs. So that what I'm pointing out here is that if I went long enough, the statistics would say the average interval between accidents is 30 days. All right, happens to fit a certain statistical distribution you don't have to worry about. It's a common way to model random events. So this is going to happen once every 30 days. So now I said, Gold Sim, all right, an accident occurs every 30 days. What happens? What's the consequence of the accident? And my consequence is another thing. It's going to be called a discrete change. Because what we're going to do is we're going to instantaneously do something. In this case, we're going to destroy 1,500 widgets. So I'm going to say I'm going to put in a discrete change. I'm going to call this destroy widgets. And it's the units are widgets. The value is 1,500. All right. And I'm going to say there's a trigger. When do I destroy the widgets? 
I destroy the widgets when an event called accident occurs. So let's look, you see what I've said, I've, I've got a trigger here. The trigger says on event accident, destroy 1500 widgets. That's what I've just told Goldsum. So I've got these two objects. An accident occurs once every 30 days. When it occurs, 1,500 widgets. I just have a number, 1,500. But I haven't told, there's one other thing I haven't told Goldsim. What, what haven't I told it? Which widgets am I destroying? Okay, so the way you could think about this is every 30 days we throw a baseball. Okay, this guy th shoots out a baseball every 30 days. This guy catches the, the baseball pulls out his pen and writes on it 1500 okay then he's gonna throw it to somebody else who's then gonna process it and who we want to process it is the warehouse one in warehouse one you may have noticed that warehouse one is kinda strange all, all these reservoir elements we had a an addition rate but we also had an addition and you might have wondered why do you have an addition rate and an addition what's the difference an addition rate is a flow an addition is a discrete change. So you might say, oh, okay, I'm going to click that and just type in 1,500 widgets. Goldsum's unhappy with that. Why can't I just type in 1,500 widgets there? Because it doesn't know when that. Doesn't know when. When do I destroy 1,500 widgets? It turns out that this input field only accepts outputs from this object. Because this object carries two pieces of information when and how much. So I'm going to put in destroy widgets here and now what's going to happen, we're going to run this model and about every 30 days we're going to destroy 1500 widgets. Wouldn't that be a discrete event as a Oh, sorry, absolutely. You're right. If I would have done just that right there, I'm glad you did that. If, if I would have, I could have put in an addition and would have added 1500 widgets. Now, you're right, I don't want to add 1,500 widgets, I want to destroy the widgets, so I want to put it in as a withdrawal, not an addition. Thank you. All right, but I could also, by the way, this just points out, if I wanted to, I could instantaneously add something to this collection, too. If I want, uh, for some reason, if I had some good reason, we'll say instantaneously add something in one, you know, slug, I could do that. Here I'm just destroying them. So now when I run this model, um, and uh, look at my warehouse. Um, uh, we have this mess, so let's just look at one realization at a time. And now you can actually see the, dis the, the destruction, the carnage that's happening. All right, look at my realization one, it happened at 40 days. 55 days and about 85 days. Do you see that? that? That was the destruction of the widgets. The second realization happened there th three times. Once. How many times should this event have occurred on average? Yeah, which is 3.3 times, right? And if you look at the statistics, we could actually see that, that on, on average it occurred three times. Here it occurred three times. Here it occurred one, two, three. Here it occurred once. Here it occurred twice. One, two, three, four, five. That's just how the dice roll, right? On average, you would see that this guy occurred 3.3 times per realization, because that's the statistics that we put in. All right? So, what I'm, what I'm showing you there is things like a, sudden events, like accidents, or um, it, it could be a, 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 a regulation change. There's all sorts of stuff that is sudden and has an immediate impact on your system. Um, a work stoppage, you know, a strike or something, that's a sudden event. Maybe we have some statistics on it. Let's, a failure of equipment, this is a classic example. <coughs> One time, we built a model which was quite interesting. It was a, it was, it was a, a alumina refinery in Australia. So they basically they had this mine, and 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 what they did is they had to ship the, um, they had to load the material onto a ship. Okay, 
when the ship was in port. Okay? Well, in that they had a big crusher which crushed the material and then they had a conveyor belt. Well, guess what? Crushers and conveyor belts fail. Okay? They fail. If the thing failed while it was while the, the ship was in port, that's bad news because you're paying for that ship to sit there while you're loading it. And if you can't load it too bad, you're paying us money because we're sitting here twiddling our thumbs. All right? So the simulation model had statistics on how often these crushers failed and how often the conveyor belts failed and how long it took to re repair them. And you could run this model and say, oh, we're going to have to spend $3 million a year to have because we're going to have failures while the ship is sitting there and it's going to cost us $3 million. How much would it cost us to build a parallel conveyor belt and a parallel rock crusher so that if we did have a failure we can immediately ship to the other one? And now you can start to play games with, oh, is it worth this capital cost? Yeah, over the long run it is because if we fail and the ship's in port, look how much it's costing us. There's a word for that. What's the word when you have to pay somebody when they're sitting there? There's a, yeah, yeah. Right? So that's. The, I, I, when I was doing this model, I learned a new word is what you have to pay the shipping company as it's sitting there and they can't be loaded. Right? Um, but it was a lot, I was shocked and I said, whoa, that's a lot of money. Right? It was a substantial amount of money that you had to pay this company to sit there because you couldn't load the ship. Right? Um, so in that example, that's an example where s there were great statistics on failures. They, they kept these things all the time. Right? And so you could actually include that into your model, these failures. Oh, it fails about every 60 days and it takes five days to get the darn thing repaired. So you can model that and do it probabilistically and you could actually see the probability that you would be broken down while the ship was sitting there waiting. And that was a, you know, a, a, a worthwhile exercise. So that, that's, what, yeah, go ahead. I keep getting an error on it. Um, can you click on Warehouse 1 real quick to look at the withdrawals? Um, I had the demand that was this random demand. Are you st do you have the random yeah, demand? Everything works out fine until I put the destroy, attach the destroy. And what happens? <laughs> what happens is at about day 90, because you've had it's so many high incidences of 1,500 units being destroyed, that the out of state drops down below zero. It's yes, you can do that. So you're probably getting a warning message. Yeah. that we drop below zero. So what's happening there, Gold, uh, the Goldsmith is warning you, hey, this guy actually went empty. Do you realize that? And, and, and in order to capture that, we may have to put in some logic. But by the way, if I, dis if I'm, if I destroyed 1,500 widgets, if, if I destroyed 1,500 widgets, but I only had 1,000 widgets in the model, yeah. it, wouldn't dis it wouldn't go negative. It would, it would only destroy what was there, and it would actually give you a warning message. It said, oh, well, you, you told me to destroy 1,500, but I only had 1,275. Your logic is a little bit screwed up here, right? I mean, it would, it would it, it, whenever it sees something like that, it says, hey, you better think about this a little bit carefully. Um, you know, maybe your logic is a little bit wrong. So that's probably what's happening. Again, because, yeah, I, we, we we're just kind of whipping these guys together real quickly, and we're emitting most of the a lot of logic that you'd have to have in a real model to make sure you didn't do something silly. Okay, so that's, that's what accidents are about. The last thing I want to talk about is in the real world, we're going to adjust that, that production rate. Remember we talked about feedback loops early today. We're going to adjust the production rate according to some rule. Okay. In particular, I'm going to monitor warehouse one and if the, if, if the inventory is less than 6,000, 6, that's my production rate. If it's between 6,000 and 7,500, I'm going to reduce it a little bit. Once I get above 7,500, I'm shutting down production. In this case, I'm saying, I don't want this guy to overflow. Right? I know he only holds 8,000, so I'm going to start ramping down production 
once I get above 6,000, once I get to 7,500, we're done. We're shutting it off, okay? This isn't how you'd really manage it, but it's just an example of let's tie our production rate to some, something in our model, in this case, the inventory in the warehouse, okay? That's what I'm going to do. So if we look at our production, right now our production was this if statement, remember? It, was just a, it, was, it had nothing to do with the inventories. It was just a function of time. All right? So we're going to delete that production. And what we're going to do instead is we're going to put in a selector. I showed you this a little bit earlier. Okay, and we'll call this guy the same name, production, and it's widgets per day. And now we're going to put in this if statement. This is a, if you think about that, that's a nested if statement right there. You see what that is? It's a nested if statement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, oh, okay, if the warehouse is less than 6,000, it's 500 widgets per day. So in here, I'm going to say warehouse one, less than 6,000 widgets. If that's the case, my production rate is 500. Okay. Then I have to get another piece of logic. So, well, if it's between 6,000 and 7,500, I want it to be 250 widgets, all right? So I'm going to put in another, what we call switch. And now I'm going to say if warehouse one is less than 7,500 widgets. What did you do to put in the extra switch? Uh, let me do it again here. Let me delete that. So. Put your cursor right here, kind of in the second line, and then say add switch. And it just adds it. You see that? And now I'm going to say if warehouse one is less than 7,500 widgets, we're at 250. And you say, well, I'm, now I'm completely confused. What are you doing here? Isn't this really should be if warehouse one is between 6,000 and 7,500? Said, yep, that's what I just told you. Because if you think about how this works is, I could have a whole bunch of if statements. All of them could be true, All right? I could have multiple if statements that could be true. Which one does the software use? If, if, if both of these guys are true, what's the answer? No, no. If, 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 for example, if it's 5,000, this statement is true and this statement is true, what's the production rate? If there's 5,000 widgets, both those statements are true. Production rate is 500. It's the first true statement. That's how a nested if works, too. You could have a nested if where all of them were true. As soon as it finds the first true statement, it's done. Right? So that's what we're done here. It's going to walk down the list, and as soon as it finds a true statement, it's done. So this guy says, if warehouse is less than 6,000, the answer is, f this guy right here is the same. I could have written it this way, by the way. I'll just make it longer. I could have written it this way. I could have written, if warehouse one is greater than or equal to 6,000 and warehouse one is less than 7,500. That's the real, that's the real thing, right? That's really what I'm saying. But I know that that must be true because I will never get to this point if that guy is false, right? If I'm down here, it means that this must be true. Otherwise, I would have quit after the first line. 
You see that? So I can do this, and it's okay to do that, but I don't need to. I could just eliminate that. And so I say, if, if it's less than 6,000, that's the answer. If it's less than 7,500, it's that. Otherwise, it means it must be greater than 7,500. Therefore, I'm going to shut it down to zero. That th this is no different than writing a nested if statement. When you write a nested if statement in Excel, the same thing happens. Your first if and your second if could both be true. The first if is going to take, the first time it sees an if, that's the one that takes precedence. It won't even do the next statement. That's how a nested if statement works. It takes the first two. And because people forget that, we actually write it right up here. But of course, nobody reads dialogues, okay? So it doesn't help that much. But in case you do, there it is. All right, it tells you this is how we're going to work. The statements are evaluated in order, and we're going to take on the value corresponding to the first true statement that is encountered. Okay? So now I've put in a production rate. Okay? And now it looks like I have a double headed arrow, by the way. If I click on it, it looks like I don't have a double headed arrow. Got two arrows. That's a feedback loop. Right? What I have here is the warehouse, the inventory is a function of the production rate. The production rate is a function of the inventory. And now I have a feedback loop there. For some reason, one of them would be that. Um, click on your warehouse and double, double click on your warehouse. Okay, close it. Oh. oh. Production, you, your units are wrong. Okay, close that. So go back to your production, right? This guy has units of widgets per day. That's what it's unhappy about. All right, so the units were wrong, so it wouldn't accept them into the, and now it should be okay. If you hit click on the warehouse again, um, now it hooks up. There you go. All right, so now we've actually created a feedback loop. And now we're never going to overflow. We're never going to overflow this guy. So when I run this model um, and I plot my history, um, warehouse, it's all, we're always at warehouse. L look at the, the, well, let's just plot the history for warehouse one. Right click on warehouse one. And you'll notice that warehouse one never comes close. It doesn't get to 8,000 now, right? Because we shut it, once it got to 7,500, we shut off production, right? So you knew that you could actually, and you could make your, uh, if you want to hold less inventory, spend less money on inventory, you could make that adjustment. Sure, yeah. Like seeing this, and if you're going to be holding steady state at 7,000, why not hold steady state at 2,000? Exactly. You can, yeah. Yep. I mean, you'd have to do that. You'd have your safety stack is it, Exactly. Right. You'd have to play around with that. Um, but here, in this case, I just wanted to make sure I, I, the warehouse can't hold more than 8,000. So, by the way, I didn't shut off production at 8,000. Okay. I shut off production before we got to 8,000. Right. Because otherwise, I probably would have hit 8,000. Right. So, you know, I wanted to, I, I wanted to shut it down. So now I've, I've got a feedback loop here in my system. Um, and, I, and I can look at um, you know, how, how the production rate and the, and, the, and the warehouse kind of interact with each other. So just a simple, obviously in a real model you wouldn't have such a simple rule, but you get the idea of how, and, and these things exist. Obviously you have, there's rules that you have on what your production rate or what, whatever your shipping rate would be, and it would be a function of a whole bunch of other things in your model. Right? So you'd have feedback loops. We don't think of them as feedback loops, but they really are. That's what we really have. This happens all the time in the real world. That's how we make decisions. As I said, sometimes, unfortunately, this logic is in Joe's head, all right? And Joe hasn't written it down, right? But hopefully, you know, in a, in a bigger company, yeah, this is, there's some kind of manual that says this is how we do these things. And these are the rules. But in a small company, a little tool and die shop or something, maybe, nah, just, you know, they don't have any hard rules. 
in a big company when you show the, the rules to somebody who's doing the job, they say, oh yeah, we stopped doing that three years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it's, it's very common that the hardest part of building a simulation model is getting these rules out of somebody if they're not actually codified and written down in some kind of manual or something. Um, but if we're going to simulate the system, we have to know what their decision rules are. How do they make these decisions? When do they cut things off? When do they ramp things back? Okay, so th that's... You know, that was the last of the models we're going to build. And that was a lot. You know, that was really taking a drink from a fire hose for the last couple hours. I threw a lot at you. And we, I didn't give you a lot of background on how to use the software. But that's OK. The purpose here wasn't to teach you how to use the software. The purpose was to get you, have you understand what do we mean by using a piece of simulation software? How would you go about doing it? Um, what do we really mean by simulation? And hopefully you get an idea of what we mean by simulation, how you can make these predictions, how you can account for uncertainty, um, and so on. These models that you typically build, a real world model is big. L let me show you a, a, a couple, uh, let me show you that supply chain model um, that, uh, that, there was that, that supply chain model, that it's, it's just a toy model, it's actually on our website, you could download it if you wanted to. Um, it's not hard at all, actually. Um, I'll, I'll show you how to add a dashboard in a minute. Let me show you a real model, and then I'll show you how you would add a dashboard. Um, so this is that auto supply chain model. These guys are containers. So that's a, that's a, the, you can change the images. So I, I put in some, I did this 15 years ago, but there's a little image of the OEM. And so I can click into that container. And so that's the, ob and these are all containers too. So I have another, let's show you the, the structure of this model. So that is the structure for the manufacturing component. Um, and the manufacturing component just has some simple calculations, but I have a strike. I like that little guy there. So I have a little strike image here, and there's the logic for simulating a strike. And I, I kind of simulate the strike, and I, have, I, I sample how long the strike duration is. It's an average of 42 days. I have these sudden events where we're turning off the assembly line, we're turning it back on, and so on. You, you, you kind of get the idea of how, you would, how you'd represent a system like this, OK? Um, and then I can go over, and here's the, the powertrain, the tier one supplier. It has a similar structure. Um, but you know it's it's it's, it's slightly different, um, and this model is you know this was a toy model it was just built for information, but it was 260 elements, right? Because it's real enough, it's realistic enough to actually simulate um, uh, you know that that change in inventories and stuff right to actually show look at the impact of this and I set up a little dashboard here's a dashboard for this model where you could actually play with games like well let's play with the delays these are the two main delays delay in communicating parts requirements within the OEM delay in passing order from OEM to powertrain right and so what I can do here is um, I can I can play some what-if games um, and I can say let's let's improve that delay. All right, and then run the model and see what that does to our inventories, and it helped a little bit in terms of the fluctuations. So you can start to play little. This was a, just a toy to show how those two delays could. Um, could impact and give you this bullwhip effect. Um, remember the truck model? Uh, I think I have that one here too. Um, this is this model of, of the, the long haul truck market. And just to show you what it is, so I, I have, uh, uh, there's a demand model here. This is actually a demand that's simulating the GDP. Um, and then it, it's delayed. So I, I think the demand for trucks was the GDP um, from um, uh, 
yeah, three months previous, right? So the, the trucks you need now is whatever the GDP was three months ago. It was something like that, right? Um, so we, we simulated the GDP, which obviously was a kind of a, you know, a Mickey Mouse little model. We just had a random walk on it. I won't go into, we use the historical GDP. Um, and we had, we simulated the GDP and then that, that was used to calculate our demand. And then based on that, we, we looked at the different truck inventories of different ages and so on. Won't go into the details there, but this is what was really important. This is, this is kind of cool. This is the key feedback loops controlling sales rates. So you basically came in here and we say, well, look, we're gonna keep track of um, the coverage of new trucks and the coverage, and when I say old trucks, these are trucks, these are used trucks, but they're not being used. These are trucks that are available and they're sitting on the side of the road. Nobody's using them. So you, used means not new. It's a bad terminology here. This is the coverage of new trucks. This is the coverage of old trucks, okay? Based on the coverage, I can, I, I can tell something about how much it would cost how much people would be willing to pay for that and that then is going to affect how much I'm going to be able to sell a new truck for. And so there was, there was this feedback loop in here that kind of kept track of all these vehicles on the road and what it would do to prices looking into the future. So that was kind of the whole logic and, and this right here took me and this guy from McKinsey about three days just to kind of figure it out for the whole market. Well, this is how the world, this is how the market, he, and he knew a lot about the truck market. I knew nothing about it. And he said, hey, here's how it works. It looks, it works like something like this. And, but that took some time to kind of figure it out, look at the data. How does the real system work? Once we knew that, building this model took, I don't know, a half day. Yeah. So we have a little bit more than a half an hour left, and I don't know whether you had other stuff. One thing I was I'm done. One thing I was hoping we could maybe talk about is because not everybody is going to be able to, you know, build a model in this sort of environment. Yeah. You had mentioned the idea of, you know, if you were going to build a model in Excel, you know, given the fact that it has shortcomings compared yeah. to this, how would you even approach that? Could could we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean. L let me just, before we do that, let me just, the last slide and what I handed out is if you guys do want to learn more about simulation, I mean simulation is going to take some time to learn. So I, I just put some textbooks up here. This first one is kind of a classic textbook from a guy at MIT in the, in Slo in the Sloan School there. Um, it's, a, it's a 900 page tome, so it's not something you're going to, uh, uh, you know, read in a short amount of time, but it, he talks about all a lot of the stuff I talked about here. They use different sets of tools, but the concepts are the same. And then these are two very specific to modeling not just businesses, but supply chains. This guy's an MIT guy too. I don't remember where this guy is. This guy's really, really complicated and detailed models. But looking at these things might give you an idea of how you actually sim you can simulate supply chains. They're kind of, kind of interesting. But okay, getting to Bill's question, um, you know, th there is no, there's no, every problem is different, right, unfortunately. Um, what I would start out with is um, kind of the, those slides I, I showed you, you previously. Um, what am I trying to calculate? So I, I showed you some, uh, this guy here. What, what am I actually trying to calculate? Um, and can I calculate it in a spreadsheet? And, and for many problems, the answer is sure, I can do that in a spreadsheet. Given my assumptions, I can do that in a spreadsheet. All right? But what you really have to ask yourself is, in order to calculate it in a spreadsheet, let's, what do I have to assume? Well, I have to assume that there's no delay between here and here. And I have to assume that there's no feedback between here and here. That's OK. Just make sure you know what you're assuming. right? And if you conclude, well, that's really a bad assumption, then you have to say, well, oh, I, OK, I, I have to include that. I have to include that in my model. Um, and, and, and you would typically do something like this, right? This is what we end up doing. I mean, you would, I would draw a flow chart or something. How does the system work? Which parts of the system can I ignore? Which parts of the system can't I ignore? And every problem is different, right? And 
typically you got to sit around a room and say, guys, is this really important? How, oh, yeah, that's, I, that's, we can't ignore that. And oftentimes you don't know. The way you know is you build a model, let's say in a spreadsheet, and say, that's nothing like the real world at all. What am I do? I must be leaving something out, right? I must be assuming something, because that doesn't look like the real world at all. I know it doesn't behave that way. When people build simulation models, what they do is they, they, um, they build a model, and then they've got data from last year. So you put in all the data from last year, you also have the results from last year. You compare, and, and your model is going to have three or four parameters that you just pulled out of the air. You have no idea what they are, right? So they're just, they're kind of like fudge factors. You run the model that you created and you compare it to what happened last year. You adjust those fudge factors until your model matches more or less what happened last year. Then you say, oh, the model's calibrated. Now I can run the model forward using the fudge factors I had before. Now, there's a little caveat to that. The more fudge factors you have, the easier it is to match anything, right? So if you've got 10 fudge factors, your model can match anything, right? You just kind of twist it around until it matches. It doesn't mean it's a good model, but the more fudge factors, you want to build a model that only has one or two kind of fudge factors, things that you can't really measure very well, right? And then see if you can adjust just those one or two fudge factors to match what happened last year or the last 10 years. If you can, you say, oh, I feel pretty good about this model. Yeah, I only have to adjust these two things. If you've got 10 fudge factors, I wouldn't trust the model at all because anybody can, can adjust 10 fudge factors to get a result. Doesn't mean it's a predictive model, right? But you have to, if you're going to build a model, it would, it's really nice if you can compare it to the past. But if, if the system you're modeling doesn't exist yet, you're, 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 you're going to build it, or you're just starting a company, then it's hard, you can't do that. There is no past to compare to, right? So you can't always do that, unfortunately. If, if you, you mentioned the whole idea of figuring out what are the performance metrics or what are the values you're attempting. Obviously, if you don't know what that is, then you're just sort of wasting your time. You're total waste of time. So you have to, so for in, in our little warehouse model, we would start out and say, oh, I want to know what the inventory is in warehouse one, warehouse two, and warehouse three over the next year. That's what I'm trying to calculate, right? Period. That's, what, that's my end. That's what I'm trying to get at. Actually, you may not end there. What you really may end up is saying, what's the cost? All right? And then you, you, in between, you're calculating the warehouse inventories, but then you have to turn those into some cost, right? But if you don't state what you're trying to calculate, you can't start even start to build the model. And you can't, the big important thing is you can't say, I want to just model the system. You can't just model the system. The, the world is big. You only can model one little tiny part of the system. So what if your problem was, what's the minimum amount of inventory I can hold and still deliver 95% perfect orders or, or whatever it is, whatever it is you want to do? One of the issues with that, right, is theoretically there are hundreds of factors that all contribute to how much inventory you have. It seems to me there's a bit of an art to figure out we should include that one. This one we should hold constant or forget about. Any insights into what the best approach is there? Well, uh, you know, I, I, the insights are this thing here. The only thing I can really say, because every problem is different, is this guy right here. So what you want to do is you want to start with a simple model and run it, right? And say, oh, it, 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 again, if you've got some, it's best if you've got data to compare it to. But even if you don't have data, you can say, oh, that looks realistic. That, or you say, nah, that can't work that way. So you iterate and say, well, I need to add some more detail. But you always want to work from the top down as opposed to the bottom up. So working from the bottom up means model everything. All right? Forget it. You will fail miserably by doing that. All right? You want to, you want to always build the simplest model you can and just add more details and just keep on adding them, keep on adding them. Now, sometimes, Bill, you might, you might say, oh, OK, I've got this. It looks pretty good. But you know, I've left out two or three things. You always want to have a list, by the way, of what you've left out. right? And, and, and I like to have a list of what I've left out and why I've left it out. I'm not modeling this, and here's why I don't think I need to model this. 
I've at least got a reason. Now I've got a model I'm pretty happy with, and now always what happens, I guarantee you what will happen, you show the model to somebody, and they said, oh yeah, but you left this out. They will say that. And you can give an argument and say, yeah, I left it out for this reason. And they say, I, don't, I still don't believe it. And say, okay, I'll put it in. All right? You put it in, it doesn't make a difference. Sometimes there's just no way of, to avoid that. Right? Hopefully you can eliminate those things just using a kind of a back of the envelope calculation or just kind of common sense, yeah, I don't need to model that. That's not, I don't think that has a big impact. It may not always be possible, unfortunately. Right? So you really do have to iterate. You might want to add some stuff in and say, ah, oh, it doesn't make, if, if you see that it doesn't make a difference, I would then take it out. Because otherwise your model just has a whole bunch of crap in it that's not really necessary for the calculation. And as your models get bigger and bigger, 30% of it might be useless stuff. And you're, and you're spending time collecting all this data. It doesn't make any difference. Get it out of there. Right? Because as your models grow, you're just going to be collecting stuff that's not important. So th I know that's a wishy-washy answer, but there is, th there's, no, um, there's no recipe for these things, right? It's really, uh, uh, the, the key thing is to iterate. You, you, you basically want to build a simple model, see if it looks realistic, and then iterate on it. If it, if it and stop once you think, oh, it looks pretty realistic. It looks like I'm doing a pretty good job of capturing reality, right? Um, but it usually takes a couple of iterations to get there. And when somebody's using an Excel model, suppose I've defined these are the four things that I'm going to allow to work as variables. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Excel is not an application like this, right? I mean, it can only do so much. So is the idea you would do successive iterations with uh, it's a four-day lead time, it's an eight-day lead time, it's a two-day lead time, and then see what happens to the other variables. Well, there's, obviously there's, the more there's two issues. Can't. There's two issues is what, obviously there's what-if games with things like that, but before you get to that is, have I are, are there four variables or are there six variables? All right, so first you want to nail down which are the variables that are really important and which can I ignore. And then once you've done that, then you say, ah, okay, these are the variables that are important, now let's play what-if games. And, and, and by the way, you only want to play what-if games with things you can control. Okay, so you might have 10 variables in your model, but you can only control four of them. The, the other six are external. You know, the, it's the GDP or, or something like that. You have no control over that. You Don't mess with that. It's an input to your model. You have to have it, but you can't physically do anything about it. You just accept that as an input. But hopefully there's a couple things you can mess with. Right? You have control over things. I can add more trucks, I can build more warehouses, I can do whatever. And those are the things that you folk, we call those uh, decision variable. These are things I have impact on and I, and I can leverage these guys. Um, but you know, what you're gonna see, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. This type of analysis, it, is, it takes a while and it takes, um, uh, it takes practice, right? Like any kind of analysis takes practice. You have to do it, and it really helps if you do it in a group, right? Because if, you, if one guy is just building a model, chances are he's gonna, he's gonna leave something out. Uh, model building is great if you can sit around a table together and argue about it. Say, ah, what about this? No, you, you, gotta, you gotta include this. And so the most effective model building exercises I've been involved with is when people are all sitting around a table and, and they've got a whiteboard and they're arguing about what is important and what isn't. Um, you know, so that's, there, there's no shortcuts, unfortunately. And, and there, you can't really take a class in this stuff, you know what I mean? I mean, you can take a class on how to learn how to use a tool, but you can't take a class on how to conceptualize a model. You just have to do it, right? You just have to do it and, 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 and learn from it. When I, when I hire a young engineer, it takes them two years to become a person that I would ever let work on a customer model. Let out of the back room. <laughs> yeah, I'd be two years. I mean, it's not that he doesn't know the software, but he doesn't have insight to kind of figure out what's important and what isn't. And there's no way to, there's no, you can't read it from a book. You just have to work on some models and say, oh yeah. You know, and you kind of, you just kind of 
It's like anything else you do in your job, right? It's not that different than other things that you guys do every day. It takes experience, right? Does anybody, else, does anybody have a, a case specific question? Something or project? Well, you had one, and this was, it was more, your, your problem was a little bit more um, software specific. You, you were basically talking about how do you build um, a model that is, uh, that uses arrays of, uh, 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 of data, right? Well, w one of the cool things you can do I in most software products is, you know, when I was dealing with a, w a warehouse here, this guy's a warehouse, but he's just a single warehouse. But what, what I can do is I can actually create a, an array of warehouses. And the way I'd create an array of warehouses, I come up here and I say, I want to create some array labels. If I'm going to create an array of, of warehouses, I have to label those warehouses. So I could create an array label set. I'll give them a name set. We'll call these guys warehouses. And I would add these guys. This is the one in Michigan. And this guy's in Indiana. All right. And this guy's in New York. All right, and so I've just created an array, a set of array labels, and now my warehouse, I can say my warehouse isn't a scalar, it's a vector, it's an array of warehouses. If my warehouse is a, a vector of warehouses, if my, if my reservoir is a vector of warehouses, guess what that initial value has to be? An array of warehouses. I can't put one number in, I have to put three. My addition rate, it's different for each warehouse. My withdrawal rate is different from each warehouse. My lower bound, my upper bound is different for each warehouse. So I could create a variable over here, for example, just to show you how that would work, I would say my initial, initial um, inventory, and I'd say it's in widgets, but it varies by warehouse, so I make it an array of warehouses. And instead of putting one value in, I put in three. I put in a value for Michigan, and I put in a value for Indiana, and I put in a value for New York. And now my warehouse takes that guy. And he's happy with that because he's an entire array of warehouses. This is, I could accomplish the same thing by creating three different reservoirs. But why bother to create three different reservoirs? Just create one warehouse, one, one reservoir and say it's an, it's an array of reservoirs. So everything that we've talked about today, if you want to do an array of, of things, you can do this. Right? Obviously I went through it quickly, you'd have to look at the documentation to figure out how to do this properly. But conceptually, conceptually you can imagine I can have an array of items. Right? And each, each item I'm tracking separately. Right? Um, who had the, there was a, were you the Starbucks guy? Yeah. Okay. Um, that Starbucks problem is an interesting problem. If I were to model that problem, I wouldn't use Goldson to model that problem. I would use a discrete events simulator because I think the only way to, to model that system is you have a whole bunch of different items that you have to track separately, right? right? And you have a whole bunch of different stores that you have to track separately. And there's different transportation times between all the stores, right, and, and, and the warehouse. So in order to track that, you would really, you couldn't do something generic like we've done here. I really think you'd need, um, and, and that model, by the way, would, would be time consuming to build. But I, it certainly can, could be built in, in, a, in, a, in a model that, that tracked the different items in the different stores. The complicating factor there is you have transportation times and, and, and there's transportation networks and so you really need a traffic model then too and, and what's the route that you would go and, and so and, and then you get into the traveling salesman problem which you know wh which order do I do it in theoretically it can be done but the optimizing that problem is very complicated right because which you know that's a classic problem in operations research 
what order do I go to these different locations, right? It's a, it's a kind of an old standard problem that's 50 years old. Um, your problem reeks of that a little bit, right? What's the order in which I do it? That's a tricky problem that I don't think you could program generically like this. It would be very difficult to do. Um, so you're going to have to do something simplistic in a spreadsheet or something, recognizing that the system is way more, uh, uh, there's probably more realistic ways to do it. Yeah, we'll have to simplify a lot. You're going to really have to simplify that problem a lot, absolutely. Um, but Starbucks should have the resources to get, uh, there's people, there's companies out there that do this discrete event modeling. Yeah. They could do that. Uh, that's, a, that's a modelable problem, all right? It's just not something you're going to do in a week or two. Um, there's there's a there's a discrete event simulation ne uh, arena. We don't we don't compete in that arena because it's an ugly arena to compete because there's about ten different tools um, that that are used in that arena and they tend to be big companies. There's a company called Arena um, um, that is is one of the big 800 pound gorillas. There's another company uh, software called Witness that's used in that. There's one called Pro Model. These are all big companies that are mainly used for uh, things like um, uh, modeling assembly lines and stuff like that. I'll bet Boeing uses one of those, for example. Pro Model is one that keeps coming up with my groups. Yeah, so Pro Model is used a lot. It, 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 Pro Model was built, it, the company is in Michigan. So they were originally designed to model assembly lines. And that's really their bread and butter. They model you know, manufacturing facilities. Oh, let's move that welding machine 10 feet closer, right? That's the kind of things they model in that software. So, yeah. I've got one group that's got a bit of a brain buster. Could I do some quick whiteboarding? Sure. And Ricky, do I have your permission to kind of throw this thing up on the... Yes, sir. You okay? You turn it, I think if you turn it off, it'll probably go up itself. Sorry. I'm That's alright. a variable to the. Is there a protector button? Is this projector like one? I shut down the projector. But. We'll do it on the side over, over We can see it over on the side. So, so here's the reactor, what it takes so long <laughs> to shut it down. And I'll, and I'll do this really fast. So here's the business problem. If you correct me if I'm wrong, we've got a, a manufacturing plant in Mexico that's producing computers. And uh, uh, the, the client has, the, the company that's in the group, has a contract to move these units from the production plant in uh, Mexico up to an interim distribution center, correct? Correct. In uh, Tennessee. And then that gets distributed out either to the west coast to a port, right? But well, before that move, though, they move it across the border to Texas. There's another holding yard in Texas. Another holding yard. Right. Okay. And then from Tennessee, it goes out to? Um, the end customer, or it can go to another warehouse in um, um, California. And, and the service level contract has to be what, a certain number of hours? hours. 33 hours to, this, to these points? To Tennessee. To Tennessee, it has to be 33 hours. So to get to Tennessee though, it has to go through the border right there. So there's a, there's a warehouse on either side of the border probably. There's a warehouse in Texas and there's a, um, uh, a staging yard on the other side. Yeah. There's a warehouse in Mexico and there's a snowing yard in Texas. Mm -hmm. so, so here's the biggest, biggest, the business, business problem is the demand curve, the, the supplies, the inputs coming out of this plant looks like this. It's complete, it is all over the map, whereas the contract is written to look more like this. In other words, they have almost no insight into production coming off the floor, right? The production plant has got incentives to build as fast as they can go regardless of the demand. The, the regardless of the demand. So they have, the team has almost, this. the trucking company has almost no insight into what's coming. So they build their, their business model around service levels that look like this, 
but it could be extremely high, in which case they have to hire additional trucks, which are very expensive, right? Or they have to have the trucks that they committed <coughs> sitting around deadheading, doing absolutely nothing, right? So that's coming out of the plant. The second stage, what's going on in this yard here? What's the business part? Is that relatively predictable? Right, yeah, once the, once the yard, once the um, equipment arrives there, um, it's relatively predictable. And once it arrives there, that's when the time starts, the um, service hours to get it to um, Tennessee. Um, once it's there, then we, by the time it's there, that's when So I understand why you don't, what's not predictable? They, yeah. They have no insight into the production coming off the floor in Mexico. I thought you said they're just cranking as fast as they can. The production line is, but they don't know. There's, they, they have a certain number of trucks who are committed every single day to showing up to the plant. But it turns out that the variability is all over Oh, there's the huge variability in the production rate. Exactly. And they have no insight into that. The production so they, rate and then whoever they load the trailer onto, too, right? Because not all four of these um, companies can carry each other trailer, too. So really don't know what's coming across the border until it mm -hmm. arrives across the border. And so once it arrives here, it's relatively smooth, right? They kind right. of know what it is, they, they do a count. And, right. So the production is actually like, on a daily basis it varies widely? Or is it, I mean, how? what's the variability like? Is it, I mean, can, they can't get any insight? Uh, some, some insight, but again, it's a delay in data. Mexico to, um, uh -huh. so it's classic, so it's, it's yeah. Because the contract manufacturer gets paid to produce as many units as they can go. Doesn't, doesn't matter what the inside is. And these guys are third party, right? They're just like, hey, we'll just send our trucks to show up there. And, and so here's the, here's the question. The business value, so right now the service level is what, 39 hours? Correct. 39 hours, which leaves them vulnerable to losing this multi-million dollar year contract to move all this crap from Mexico up to up to Tennessee, right? So the business proposition is what? Getting is getting the service level down within the contract. Right? Right. So then the question is, I'm trying to figure out how to, you gotta figure out how to calculate value, right? Because somehow you're trying to convince the people in the supply chain that there's value in 33 hours. More predictability. Because there's what? a certain amount of variation in just the traffic time, but that's relatively mm -hmm. predictable, right? A certain amount of variation. Do they know what the units are coming off here? They don't know until they get there, right? right. They do the count there. So they actually know what the counts are here. And then this is relatively, this is just traffic and yeah. weather, right? right? But it's this, it's this issue. Right it's there. basically, right, do you have the trucks to, when it shows up there, is there trucks available? Right. Right. Yeah. Well, who's paying for the trucking? Yeah. Because obviously the people in the factory could care less. If they were paying for the trucking and they were the trucks were empty, they would try to align more closely. The brand, right? the brand is essentially paying for it, right? These contract manufacturers, third party uh, transportation company, and then the actual brand of the computer company. So this is a classic case where stating what the measures are, are is critical. Yeah. So what you really care about is well, no. What you, ultimately what you want to care about is is some 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 cost. What does the cost go from this point to this point, right? And what we want to do is reduce the cost, right? right. So you have, you have to capture all the costs in this system, right? <coughs> so you you'd have there's a cost for those guys to be sitting up there. Right doing nothing, right? There's a cost for the, the high cost option. You gave us too much, now we gotta call around and whoever's available, you gotta pay whatever rate. So you gotta get this stuff across the border. Exactly, so what you would wanna do is, um, you could build the model with the variability that you have, but actually, because this, this is certainly some, this, as you might imagine, just the stuff we talked about here with a little bit more detail, you could model that, yes, right? right? There's a delay to go across the border, then there's a warehouse there, then there's a delay to go up to Tennessee. Um, in between there, you'd want to capture all the costs. At any given time, you'd, it, oh, you'd have another, think about your stock. So we, we, we have warehouses, we, we'd be, not only would we be tracking these, these computers, you'd also be tracking the trucks. And at any one given time, you want to know how many trucks are sitting right there. Right. 
right? Right. Right. And there's some cost to have right. the truck sit there and not be used. What so you that's want? That's what they're there. That's the deal. Right. But you 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 would you would keep track of the trucks there. Whenever uh, we're whenever we're ready to load a truck, boom, away it goes. Right. And and and, and we have that. But there, you would have to model the number of trucks that are there. The cost of them. Well, no. You first you model like the, the trucks that are there, and then there's you'd associate there's a cost per day to have a truck sitting here idle, right? Right. And, and so, and obviously there's other costs in the system too, but ultimately you would, you would just model the computers moving and the, tr the main thing here is really just loading a truck and, and, and having it right. head off. Um, and the reason you go high sometimes is because there's no truck sitting there, right? Right. right. Or because they produce way too much and didn't give the third party tr trucking company Enough heads up. So there's no truck trucks. With more yeah. So more there's trucks. there's a shortage of trucks. In which right? case they have to call around and go the high cost option of finding. And so what you could and, and there's a, there's a communication process. Um, we didn't talk about a delay, but we talked about a delay in material. But there's a delay in communication. So th 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 there's also you could model a, a communication delay. From Mexico all the way to Tennessee. Well, right. whoever I mean, the the delay is it's the truck. The trucking company is uh, the the delay. It probably goes through a couple different places, right? But ultimately, the plant wants to tell uh, wants to communicate to the trucking company. Yes. N tomorrow we need five trucks. Yes. Right. Um, and so you would, but there's a delay in getting that information, so it takes a week for them to get that information. So no, they don't have the information at all, right? So what you could do is, is you would want to physically model that delay. Uh, and you saw in my supply chain model, I just had a, how long does it take for this order to go from the OEM, and I just said, oh, right. five days. Right. Okay. What if we could do it in two days, right? right? Because now if I could do it, in, and, and and, and you have to represent it to the model. Those, those, think about how the trucking company does this. It doesn't have, it doesn't care about what's happening right now. Right. It needs a forecast of what it's going to need over the next week. Right. All right. So it's going to get information from these guys, and it wants, it wants to, it's going to make a forecast. Ah, next week we're going to need this many trucks. Yeah. All right. If, if I have a big delay in that, my forecast sucks. Right. right, and so I'm going to either not have enough trucks or I'm going to have too many trucks. All right, so this is this actually is an example that's is very modelable right. in, in right. just the tool. I mean, right. there's right. more things yeah. we'd have to talk about, but this this is actually very modelable. I mean, this is the kind of model that you could you know like, yeah. you, you you could re this is a good example of something you could use in a tool like Goldson because. You don't need to track individual things. You're tracking the flows of, of these PCs. You will be tracking individual trucks, but you're not tracking millions of trucks, right? right. There's a small number, right. and you just want to know how many are sitting here and how many are in transit, and then how many are he heading back. I mean, that's all very doable. Ricky, your improvement idea here, who is it you're selling it to? The brand, the uh, transportation company? To the brand. Uh, so well, to the brand and also to a Mexico yeah, facility. Well, so, but basically the root cause of this, the ultimate metric is adherence to the production schedule, right? If there was perfect adherence to the production schedule, presumably there would always be enough trucks they wouldn't be empty. They wouldn't be overfull. I don't it's understand a, a, why they're producing. Why incentives. isn't there feed? Shouldn't there well, be feedback from <laughs> these guys up here? <laughs> well, aren't these guys coming down here and say, "Here's the demand. We want you to con control demand. I mean, we want you to control production." The contract says you get paid. You just produce as fast as you can go, and you'll, we'll just keep paying for them. Right, so it's in this an incentive problem. Yeah, that's what they're doing. That's what they're being told right. to do. Right. Right. That's what I'm saying. You can have an incentivized program that's because you, the difference, yeah. you, know, you keep 75, give them 25 of the incentive so for them to, to keep, control the demand. Yeah, for them to keep the contract, they have to convince the brand to go in and tell these people, wait a minute. We have to have some level of predictability. Well, couldn't you model how much does it cost every time but you're one percent away from the production plan? But it's, it's even worse than that. Doesn't this also result in sometimes having a big load of PCs up here that are doing that we don't need right now? Right. And the reverse. Right. Right. 
or, 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 or the reverse. Well, no, not probably not the reverse because they're just cranking as fast as they can. Yeah. But sometimes they're cranking when the demand is low. Right. Right. And then the only, other, the only issue is that um, we don't know like what's the cost of uh, of, um, of missing the service level agreement. You know, for one hour or like two hours. So we still have to figure out that piece and the impact that it has on the brand. So that's the main thing. The main thing we need to work on is. Quantifying delays and then quantifying. Co you, you, there's a cost for this, and there's a cost. I mean, I, obviously, this is fairly easy to quantify. There's some there's some real cost to have a truck sitting there. Right. All right, empty. Right. It's not clear to me what's the cost if it takes 39 instead of 33. How do you? What's the? What does that mean? In fact, there. If these guys have a ton of inventory, they don't care if it takes 39. Right? They only care if it takes 39 if they got no inventory. Right? But it says in their contract that it has to be 33s. So these guys are sweating bullets because they're like, we got this multi million dollar contract and we can't hit some basic art service level. This is the business we are in, delivering things on time, and we're 20% over. Because I agree. Because they're not getting them on time. But because right? they're because there's complete unpredictability in the in the initial input and delays. But you see the problem. Really but but, but, but right? let me, remember what I said earlier. I said you have to look at the big system. That is the problem for the shipping company. Okay. But the problem is bigger than that. The whole system seems to be a little screwed up. That they have bad incentives. And right. I mean, it, it, it now. That's beyond the, the, you know, but you know, these guys, but guys, this whole thing is, is ridiculous. Yeah, we, we want to deliver in 33, but if we deliver in 39 and you got a whole bunch of inventory, you don't care. What you care about is, I got a big demand, I need it right now, right? So, it, so the main thing it, is to get them to care, and there's got to be a creative way to build the model so that they the, need to care about Snyder the whole people, system. Snyder people can go in and just throw a few things around and just go, come on, there's, there's, there's money in this for all. In, in all. There's money for all of us to be made if we go and clean up the whole. And do it, system. And, yeah, and then, yeah. do it elegantly and right. simply, and because this is like a director and VP level problem with this company. This is a big contract. It's a big problem. Can these guys talk to these guys and say, guys, this is kind of silly the way this whole thing is running. Let's take a. These guys, yeah, they can't talk. They do, they can't communicate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So this is doable, I mean, but, and it's not complicated, but there's no way you can figure out how to do it just based, I think, in the, in the couple hours I did. That's all I would say. Well, but keep playing with it. In, in, uh, keep, keep, keep playing with it. But this is, this is a very nice application for the stuff we just learned today. Absolutely. Yeah.